primo speaker oggi è il professor Ilan Chabai dell'Istituto di Studi Avanzati per la Sostenibilità di Potsdam, in Germania. E Ilan non avrebbe bisogno di presentazioni perché è una, un personaggio molto molto noto, molto molto famoso, è stato direttore del Tutoratorium di San Francisco, ha avuto una company per vent'anni in cui produceva installazioni scientifiche per musei che sono diffuse in tutto il mondo e recentemente si sta occupando di sostenibilità, in particolare con un progetto molto grande eh, sull'Artico. Però è un grande divulgatore, chi ha visto non si sente. Eh, mi farebbe piacere parlare ancora più forte. Comunque lascio la parola a Dilan che forse ha una voce più louder del mio. Ok. okay. And, uh, se avete domande, share questions, please. I mean, raise your hands and try to translate. Cerco di tradurre per voi. Ok. Thanks, Ilan. Gladly. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm sorry for the delay. I will try to speak loudly. My father was an opera singer, so I hope I have learned at least to project. Um, but please tell me if I am unclear or if you have questions. Just interrupt. That's fine. What I want to talk a little bit about today, just briefly, is to give an impression of some ideas for how creativity and innovation can be harnessed, can be used and developed in young people and all of us older people to address the great global challenges we all face as humanity. Every one of us has to face in some way the changes in climate, the food security, energy requirements, water, land use, waste. There are many very difficult, complex problems. And one of the problems is that in our school situations, we do not learn very well how to collaborate, how to ask questions, and how to address what are not nice little compartments of ideas, but how these are connected and how we can communicate with each other about these critical ideas. So it seems strange, but in fact it's crucial that one of the key ideas that links this sort of set of problems is play. So we, I get from my colleagues in physics, chemistry, biology, oh, no, no, this is science. This is not play. And I say, oh, yeah? Why did you do it? <laughs> And many reasons often are because the ideas are beautiful, because I like to think about these things, because I saw a wonderful exhibition in the museum. Many reasons. But play is also a place where you can take risk. And for those of us who are afraid of risk, it's a safe way to make some attempts. And then there are others of us, and I'm afraid I'm in that, who look for interesting risk. But people are very different. So I want to only illustrate this very, very briefly because we're already late, so I will make it short. But to give some examples, I spent a number of years doing basic research and then uh, as professor at Stanford in fundamental science. And out of that, when I became director of, the associate director of the Exploratorium with Frank Oppenheimer, Um, I began thinking about how to help people think about what is science, not about information. That's fine. You learn that anyway. But the hard part is, how do we think about science? How do we ask questions? What kinds of questions? Where does that take us? Some of those questions are philo philosophical. Some of them are quite practical. Some are very fundamental. So I designed maybe two, three hundred experiences for 200 museums around the world, but also ended up with a few toys. And so I have this I can carry. I can't carry the other ones. But here's an object that 
It looks like an iPad, but I built it long before the iPad. Actually, Steve Jobs played with it at one point, but I assure you that's not how the iPad was developed. Um, but this is very old. I think that I made this probably 25 or 26 years ago as a, just in my shop over a weekend. So it still works, but um, oops. let me show you what it is. I hope you can see this. Here's this object. If I bring a magnet near, you get very interesting things happening. And this simple object, it's just water with magnetic material in it and some little crystals that show the way the fluid, the water, is moving. This very simple object, as you see in the picture, can be used regardless of language, culture, age, gender. And in fact, my favorite two pictures are this one with a group of nursery school children before kindergarten in America. This boy is very focused right there. He's working. These three are talking to each other. It's a social discourse. They're explaining it to each other. Ah. OK, is that better? <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, they are explaining it to each other. They're asking, how did you do that? I want to try that. Why did it do that? So what it is, it's not about teaching the information. It's about provoking the questions first. Then, if there are questions that a child has or an adult, then the answers are important. If I give you the answer first, eh, who cares? I, I can give you an encyclopedia and say, look, it's really interesting. Read it, read it. Yeah. So it's also interesting. This gentleman was at a meeting about two and a half years ago at my institute, at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. And I, just for fun, I showed it to him. And he started playing. And the director of the institute finally said, Paul, would you please sit down? We have to continue the meeting. He said, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. That's Paul Crutzen, who won the Nobel Prize in 1995 for his very important work on the ozone hole and the atmospheric chemistry. And so I love the idea that here's somebody with a Nobel Prize and very sophisticated understanding of science who was doing basically the same experiments that the children were. And the point is not the knowledge behind it, it's the questions. It's finding ways to nurture the curiosity that we all have, not just children. Hopefully, we all have and don't lose. So it's something for the, all of our lives. And it is the same curiosity that we must have and we must nurture if we are going to address the absolutely crucial challenges of our age. Very quickly, let me then show you another set of slides. I'm sorry, this may be too small to see very well, but there's a, a device up there, the ping pong pinball, which involves turning a crank, doing chemistry, turning the water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, but the point is that it's an, it is both an experiment, but it's also physical. It's an engagement in concrete action. And for many people, and not just children, that concrete instance, concrete example that you can use your hands, your muscles, your listen to, when you may turn the crank and you make hydrogen and oxygen, you release it under a ping pong ball, you make a small spark with an oven igniter, it goes boom and goes 15 meters in the air. That does get people's attention. Um, so they want to do it again. But then comes the social discourse. I turned it this way. Why did it do it differently? 
And then they begin to try experiments and ask questions. And this is a group of teachers in China with the same experiment, but just built differently. It's on 300 trucks traveling all over China with some teachers, and I was doing a workshop for the teachers. This is also in China. This is in the United States, what I call guerrilla science, not as large ape, but as subversive, rebellious, because we sold it to McDonald's, Burger King, grocery store, medical clinic, as a way of engaging people who would not otherwise even think about science or experimenting with their children. So it was a way of getting adults and children to think together about things that were unusual and surprising. And last, what you may, some of you may have seen the frozen bubbles, which I will do again or are doing again. And again, I, I don't know if you can see the faces, but there's this sort of, and again, it's that moment of what we call cognitive dissonance, the disconnect. I didn't expect it to do that. And then again, the questions begin, but in this, for example, I can talk about global warming. I can talk about ocean acidification. I can talk about why we have red blood. There are many things that connect in a very, very simple system. So the point is not that this is special science. It's the world around us that we live in. And to build that curiosity and nurture it is what I think we need in being able to go into the future successfully. Thank you.